Good morning. Uh, at Naropa, we begin classes and meetings, other events of note with a bow as a way of settling ourselves and also showing some respect to the people that we're about to engage with. So you're welcome to join me. I can't do anything without starting with a bow. It's kind of now part of who I am. So please join if you wish. Thanks. Uh, I became an AIDS activist and care provider by accident. Uh, I realized that most of the meaningful moments of my life, both professional and personal, were accidental. Um, that, I think, for me, uh, is the definition of what it means to be a social entrepreneur. I'm not sure that's textbook or if the business school down the road would teach it that way, but uh, that's the way that I've looked at it. I became a social and political activist when I was young. I was a teenager in Cleveland. Uh, at age 16, I managed to take a semester off from high school to work on a political campaign to help Carl Stokes become the first African-American mayor of a northern American city. Uh, right after that successful campaign, I had a, what was a politically unsuccessful but pretty meaningful opportunity uh, to work for the Eugene McCarthy presidential campaign which took me to Chicago, to the infamous convention in 1968, where I started out living uh, in the Hilton Hotel, actually, as a 17-year-old with the national campaign staff, uh, but ended up for the last half of the convention on the streets with the tens of thousands of demonstrators who had uh, arrived in Chicago to bear witness to a corrupt political system. And I have to say that I felt much more at home on the streets than I did in the Hilton. It's still the case, I think, for the most part. Um, at 19, uh, at Brandeis University, I was a member of Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, for those of you who can date yourself, um, fighting to end the war in Vietnam. It was at that point that I realized that while my uh, social justice passion was strong, that I was feeling uneasy with who I was becoming as a, as a human being, as I was becoming uh, more of an adult. If only mindfulness and awareness practice had been invented then, I would have, uh, I might have been able to do something about it. Uh, but what did happen, which was typical maybe of another accident, is that my uh, Jewish Marxist and now uh, Zen professor at Brandeis mentioned to me that there was a Tibetan, a guy named Chugyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who himself was only 10 years from having escaped from the political turmoil in Tibet, uh, who was beginning to teach in the West, and that what was interesting was uh, that his teaching was very pared down. Uh, at that point, to work with uh, meditation or contemplative practices came with a lot of other bells and whistles. So there was lots of, uh, there was lots of chanting, there was lots of dancing, which is not something that I was so great at. Um, fairly foreign, there was a lot of non-English, which made it very difficult. Uh, but in the case of Trungpa Rinpoche, who became my teacher uh, in 1970 and who I worked with uh, until his death in 1987, um, his teaching was in English and his work was very much in the world. Uh, first book in 1969 was called Meditation in Action, and that actually says it all, that there was a way to actually create, uh, develop a contemplative practice to work on issues of mindfulness, awareness, and compassion, and also to be in the world and to be engaged in a world that was suffering and in need of healing. So that was kind of the background uh, that ultimately brought me uh, in the early 90s to Yonkers, New York, just up the road, as the president of the Grayston Foundation, a nonprofit social enterprise uh, that worked in the areas of homelessness. We built hundreds of units of housing for homeless families. Uh, we had child care centers. Uh, we had an economic development projects. And we built an HIV AIDS health center and housing program. AIDS today is still an epidemic. I think we have to remind ourselves of that. Yes, it's changed to some extent. It's a chronic disease now more than uh, an acute disease. It isn't the death sentence that it was in the 80s and the 90s. The reality is, however, that there are millions of people around the world who are still struggling with this particular disease. And as an epidemic, it carried some of the sort of common elements that other epidemics had that basically it disproportionately impacted people who uh, lacked secure housing, who lacked access to health care, uh, who had problems with food security, those sorts of things. But it also was a very different sort of epidemic in that 
when people years or centuries before uh, contracted smallpox, for example, they weren't typically blamed for their condition. But in the case of HIV AIDS, what happened was, or at least many of us found, was that lifestyle and morality actually became the disease and HIV became the delivery vehicle. People were actually blamed for their own condition and that was the, the fundamental attitude that was held universally by many, many people. Now the reality is that there are caregivers who set aside any judgment and provided care to this population of people who were struggling with this, uh, with this disease. Um, they were doing that care within a dysfunctional system, however. The people that we worked with, for example, used the emergency room as the primary gateway to health care. Now, as opposed to no health care at all, the emergency rooms seem pretty great. On the other hand, for any of you who have had the opportunity to be in an ER for any reason, you understand that if that's your primary gateway to care, the dehumanizing uh, elements are just uh, all over the place. So we knew that there was a problem that was a question of what we could do about that. New York State decided in the 90s that it was spending tens of millions of dollars on providing AIDS health care and wasn't seeing either health care results and certainly seeing huge expenses and made a decision that people living with AIDS, low-income people living with AIDS, should enter into the managed care system. Now, we were able to argue, we and other nonprofits, for a long time that the conventional managed care systems, ones that are uh, HMOs that are still around today, were really not set up in any way to be able to address the complexity of the disease that people living with AIDS had, because after all, they had both HIV disease but also, in many, many cases, had issues of mental illness, of substance use. Um, and so there was a sort of broad struggle of a number of things that they were dealing with, including homelessness and, and other sort of non-medical, if you will, uh, conditions. The state agreed for a while and then said, well, why don't we try something? We're going to issue a request for proposals to create something new, a new kind of HMO, a special needs plan, or call it SNP and basically see if we can build something from scratch using Medicaid resources, and there were hundreds of millions of dollars of those resources, to do something in a different way. Now, the state's view was that the big hospital systems were going to propose the SNPs that would be successful, because after all, that was the system and that was where the care was being given. But they made a decision that seven nonprofits, Grayston being one, could come together and be invited to be the respondents to this RFP as well. The reality was they didn't think it was going to work, but the optics played well in Albany because all of the legislators in the Department of Health could say, see, we're giving community-based organizations that apparently know this population better than the big hospitals. They're giving them a chance to step up. We decided to come together and actually respond to that invitation. Now, we didn't know much about running an insurance company, but we figured that we built a homeless family housing development, for example, I'd have to find 20 different sources of funding. That's a whole other story about whether or not that's really an effective way to deal with the issue of homelessness. That was the reality. We were also becoming increasingly socially, uh, social entrepreneurs. Uh, our partners at Housing Works that some of you may know have run thrift stores throughout New York City and have a bookstore cafe just down the road that I'm sure many of you know well. Uh, in the case of Grayston, we have a bakery, and I keep saying we now, even though I've been gone for 20 years, because that's the nature of, that's what happens when you get into this world. Um, Grayston has a bakery, uh, hires chronically unemployed people from Yonkers. If you've ever eaten Ben and Jerry's fudge brownie ice cream or fudge brownie yogurt, you've helped contribute to what is today a $10 million social enterprise in Yonkers that has made, I figured last night, 120 million pounds of brownies. That's a whole other conversation about whether that's a good product, but nevertheless. Um, but we figured we were actually able to uh, look at uh, creating this insurance company as well. In 2003, Amedicare, the HMO that I'm talking about, was licensed and we began to do business. Uh, the first year we had 60 members, uh, about $800,000 in revenue. This was an insurance company and I'm sure most of you are not insurance company executives, but probably could figure out that for the an amount of money that wouldn't buy a two-bedroom co-op probably anywhere in New York City, that was not a sustainable model for an insurance company. But as tenacious nonprofits that we were, we kept uh, going. 
I was the CEO of Amedicare for a while. My cash flow management often involved my taking the checks that were supposed to go to the doctors that we were working with and putting it in my desk drawer and forgetting where it was for a couple of weeks until we had some more cash in, in hand, that sort of thing. Today, Amedicare is serving 6,200 people in New York City. Uh, it's a $325 million social enterprise. And what's most important is it's having a real impact on the healthcare outcomes of the people that um, uh, is serving. When we opened the doors, we decided that we did not want to create just a slightly better um, insurance company. We didn't want something that was a little bit improved from the existing system. So we had a certain number of demands, if you will, or requests, as the state put it. Um, one was that we could take a look at non-health-related causes of illness. And so, for example, we believe that homelessness was very much a symptom of people's HIV disease. And that not addressing homelessness and not addressing the issues that are, come from that um, would mean that we were losing an opportunity to really address the broader healthcare needs of our clients. And so we were able to start using Medicaid dollars to actually provide the kind of case management that would find housing for people, that would find childcare, that would find security. We asked our doctors who were in the network that we put together to uh, meet new clients in a way that they were not used to historically. So certainly they got their healthcare uh, history their medical history, but we also ask them to talk about things like experience of domestic violence, experience of uh, unemployment and poverty, because again, the view being that unless we knew the full picture of who we were serving, it would be impossible for us to actually bring about reasonable healthcare outcomes. And more, most important, I think, and maybe relevant to our conversation today, is that we also said that there are other non-traditional therapies that we think actually make sense for this population uh, because this is a group of people that we felt needed to come together to be humanized, to come together in community, and to have access to the kinds of uh, resources that frankly we privileged people easily could access, but for the most part was completely foreign to any of the people that we were serving in our HMO. And so we were also able to use our resources for art therapy and music therapy and dance therapy and importantly to many of you for yoga and meditation. Uh, and that was basically something that was completely new to the population that we were working with, but created the kind of community that is resulted today in very positive health outcomes for the Amedicare members. And without getting into lots of details, the one statistic that's worth noting is that the average member of Amedicare today uh, who has entered into care uh, is showing a 75% drop in the amount of virus that they're carrying in their body because of the fact that they've now got a comprehensive approach to caregiving. And that's a big deal with lots and lots of ripple effect. And so the model has proven itself in, in that way. Amedicare is an insurance company that does not look to say no to claims, which is very uh, atypical of insurers. Amedicare's claims managers are out there to encourage care providers to make claims by actually providing real service. And by doing so, um, engaging with the client, with the member, in a way that's completely new from any way that they've been, they've engaged before. As a company, Amedicare is also engaging in the same way. We have members on the board of directors of the HMO, so people living with AIDS sitting at the board table because we don't think that wisdom is limited to the privileged people that are actually uh, in charge of these organizations. The member advisory councils advise on policy, on new programming, and the reality is that they are coming together as, uh, as a group of people who um, have now been empowered. Uh, I'd like to uh, just show you a couple of uh, people involved with Amita Care, hear their voices. They can say it much more eloquently than I can. My drug use increased. All I wanted to do was get high. You know, so, and that's what I did. When you feel alone, 
You have no one to turn to but yourself. Now when you find out there's other people that care about you, that makes a big difference. They're free, and they're a great way to get together, have fun, and enrich your life in body, mind, and spirit. Yoga believes that our body has a tremendous capacity to heal. It's really helped in my, just my, it, allowing me to keep up with day-to-day -day activities. Very relaxing, very um, challenging. And I can't afford to, to go to a yoga class like that, unless I'm mean, okay, give me an opportunity to have a yoga class. It's amazing. Art therapy gave me a little more confidence in myself. It's a good feeling to, to create. So I didn't even know I had this talent. It's a fun activity. To do things to art and enjoy it yourself. It can be intimidating to really open up art. You don't have to talk. You could just create. The dancing makes me feel free, free of my illness, being free of everyday life and stress. It's uplifting. It makes you feel alive. One of the most important aspects of my class is that you feel welcome and that there's a place for you. It makes me feel very good and my body's loose. It's moving parts and listening to the drums and the beat, and the beat was awesome. Probably could have just limited the whole session to that. I think you get, you get the point. Uh, I will close in saying that the exciting opportunity, I think, is that there's a recognition that HMOs like Amedicare actually can play a very important role in the broader reformation of our healthcare system. And it's being looked at now as a model to deal with behavioral health, with aging, uh, with other chronic diseases. Uh, long way to go. There's much to learn uh, about what to do right. Uh, but the uh, tenacity, I think, of the people that have been running this organization now for the last 13 years, uh, built on mission and compassion and a lot of stubbornness, I think, uh, is something to be uh, looked at and uh, which we can be quite proud of. Thanks. <laughs>